20, 20, 20, 20, 15, 15, 15, 15. Mark out 15, mark out 15. We get in 19, I'm going to do it with you. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Thank you. I can't do it from here because I have to hardwire into my printer because that's how I do it. Flip it over to the back. I, I'm assuming everybody's good on the front. Do y'all want me to holler out the answer for the front? Yeah. All right, the answers starting at one are two, one, D and E. The next row is one, one, one. The next row is two, negative one, D and E. Huh? Undefined D and E doesn't either one. Limit does not exist. Eight. Yeah. All right, on the back, I'm going to give them to you, but I'm going to assume I'm going to need to work most of these. Um, starting at 10 across the row, 0, D, and E. There is a, I call 12 D, and E, but, but I understand their justification and why they say it's 0. So I will show you both of those. Um, then 4, 1, skip. Four one skip, and then zero two two. Because what I don't, I say you can't do it because you're not continuous at negative one. They go through and do it anyway. I just, I've never seen a question like that on the exam in all the years. I've, and I have gone through. I, I just, just skip it. Um, sixteen oh. 19, one half and two. I disagree with their answer on 20. I'm gonna go with two. All right. They got zero. I think you got zero because you looked at what they got. I Okay, so here's the one thing I didn't really stress yesterday, and this is on me, and I, I, I forgot, and I really should, because I, I got to get y'all in the habit early of looking. Whenever you have a definition, like, like those limit properties, and there's a little blurb at the beginning that says, in order for this to happen, this must be true. So for the limit properties, it has to be continuous. So if there's a jump or a hole or something right there, then that limit property may not apply. And I'll show you what I'm talking about on one of these. All right, look at 10. The limit as x approaches 0 of g of x over f of x. So g of x, let me get my little, um, g of x here, right, would be 0. So I've got 0 over, and then the limit as x approaches 0 on f of x would be 3. So this limit is it doesn't matter as long as it's not. Oh, two, sorry. But it doesn't matter. I don't know. I just clicked that pin. Cool, isn't it? No. No. No, can't either. Um, all right, so 11, the limit is x approaches negative 1 f of x times g of x. So I'm going to split them up, and I will warn you if you are on an FRQ portion. I cannot imagine these are an FRQ. These would probably be um, multiple choice for sure. But if, yeah, no, on multiple choice what? Mm -mm. On FRQs, you have to show every single step. So make sure if you do hear that you Split them up and write the limit each time as you do that. But anyway, um, there is no limit at negative one because at negative one, the limit is different from the left and the right. There are one sided limits, but there's not an overall limit. So this is D and E, which means the whole thing does not exist. Same for the second. Now, let me explain to you for just a second about why they got something different for the second. So, for this one, we know that as I approach 2 on, which one does not exist? On this one, this one does not exist. But by definition, what does it mean to be a limit at a value? The limit as you approach from the left has to equal the limit as you approach from the right. And if that holds true, 
then the limit as you approach that value holds true. So what they say is, if you look at each one-sided limit here, in other words, if I do the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x times g of x, are you following me? If I approach 2, 2 from the left, right, I get like 3, and 2 from the left on g is 0, so this is 0. I don't know, 2, 2 from the, is, oh, yeah, 1, sorry. Doesn't matter because that's 0, right? Then I get 0 here. If I do it from the right, because this limit is zero all the time. I get zero again, and they're saying, therefore, the limit overall is zero. The left-hand limit is the right. I argue that. I say because it does not exist when you split it up. But Okay, but I did want to show you that and how they got that. All right, look at the next one. <clears throat> Y'all need this one? Yes? Two times, all right, so the limit as I go to zero on F, why is it so hot in here? It's two, right? So I've got two times two plus, because this number can come outside the limit. Three times, what's the limit as I go to zero on G? Zero. All right, 14 I talked about with you yesterday. Do y'all remember that? I said you can look at the whole graph as shifting left to, or what you can do, and this seemed to be what everybody understood a little bit better, is instead of shifting the graph to, shift what you're approaching by to. But if you do that, it's same sign. So really, this is the same thing as, as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x. And then it's a lot easier to see. As I approach 2 from the left, it's 1. Get this one. Didn't have any of what? We taught, we didn't practice it. We taught, this was your practice. 16. As X approach, all right, so I got this compound function. Remember what we do with com composite functions. Not why is mine different? Right. G of the limit of as x approaches negative 2 of f of x. What's the limit as x approaches negative 2 on f of x? 0. It's 0. So I've got g of 0. So I go back to that graph. What's g of 0? 0. Easy. I hope y'all are okay on these limits because today's limits. Well, today's the algebraic manipulation. This is this would be a multiple choice problem, I'm sure of it. Yeah. Um, for this one again, f of the limit as x approaches two, this time from the left of f of x. Well, what's the limit as you approach two from the left on f? Whoa. F two from the left. What is it? Oh, that's negative two. Shut up, Stacy. Okay, there. One. What's f of one? Two. I feel like I don't need to work every single one of these. The negative, all right, when you have a negative, with a limit like that, that treat it like a coefficient, right? So, somebody's phone's messing up. We know who's it is. Oh, well. Why do we just do? Oh, 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 you were on your phone. Oh, you know. Okay. 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 Miguel, you got your phone? All right, so the limit as x approaches 2 from the right on f. 2 from the right. All right, look, look, look. 
two from the right, what is it? Negative one, but it's the negative of it, right? So it's positive one, so I'm looking for f of one because of this negative here, yeah. Which is, the, right. All right. Oh boy, this one. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to split this one up. This is a composite function again. So I'm going to do f of the limit as x approaches negative 1. This is the, this is probably the hardest one on here. No? No. What? I don't know what y'all are talking about. Oh, you're talking about sliding it over. Sliding it. I see what you're saying. You tried to slide it to the right, two and a half. This would be an up or a down because it's tagged on to the end. It's not hooked to the X. So it would be a down two and a half if you did it that way. Right. See how it's X plus two and you slid it to the left? You can't do that here because if you think about your transformations, it's hooked onto the end, so it's down, to, it's not left and right, it's up or down. It's a vertical translation instead of a horizontal. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Then you could do that, that's correct. That's correct. Um, the limit as x approaches negative one on g, what is it? Somebody tell me. Come on, y'all can do this one. So this is f of one minus, now think about this. If I'm doing the limit of a constant and a constant can go to the front, right? It's just 2.5. That's always going to be your limit of a constant. 2.5. So I've got f of negative one and a half. Go to your graph. What is the value of f at negative one and a half? 0.5 or one half. I'm sorry. It is working in here because mine's hooked up. Maybe it's just yours. Where I see what? Go to negative, might have to, negative one and a half, negative one and a half is like right here. Yeah, right, right. All right, for the very last one and then we will move on. <laughs> dragging a little bit. Um, so I, when I worked this one, I did g of x, and I said that I was squaring it. I used that exponent property and squared it after I took the limit plus the limit as x approaches 0 of 1. This one, as I go to zero on G, what do you get? That's that point zero zero. We keep referencing that over and over and over again. This is zero, and zero squared is zero. So I've got F of zero plus, that's one. They didn't do this. They didn't. That's why I said I don't agree with their answer on this one. They're wrong. Yeah. Before I give you a bigger answer, I'm going to work through them from now on and check them first and see. Well, look. I'm sorry. My struggle is real. This I am struggling. I gave out so much candy yesterday just begging them to write something down. Problems that we do. This is where you see the most kind of multiple choice problems with limits. Um, here's what I'm going to tell you. This is not on here, but a what? This is my this is my rule of thumb, and this is how I do limits. This is how I think about limits and what I do with them. 
when you can, I can go over these limit rules with you, and and you can apply them and you can use them. But at the end of the day, my rule of thumb algebraically is when you can plug in. If you can't plug in, and this will make sense in a minute. If you can't plug in. Manipulate until you can. Manipulate. So, if I plug in and I get a zero in the denominator, I can't plug in. That's your biggest. You get something undefined when you plug in, you can't plug in. Okay? When we get to infinity, you'll see it gets a little bit harder to plug in because it's more of a conceptual thing than it is an algebraic thing. But we still use properties of algebra to, um, to evaluate. But looking at your limit rules, what? You've got these three rules. We really already talked about this one. If, if you approach a value and this number is a constant, you just get that constant. That was like the limit as x approaches 0 of 2.5 would be 2.5. It doesn't matter as I approach 1 of 7. What is it? 7. It's always going to be 7. It doesn't matter what number you approach. It's always going to be that constant. That's that first property. Okay. Um, the second property is just plugged in. As x approaches c, so you plug in c for x, that's like saying the limit as x approaches 2 of x, what would that give you? 2. That's what I mean by plugging in. We're plugging in the value for the x that's there to find the limit. Yep. Because you plug in 2 for x, you let x be 2. At the end of the day, if it's a continuous function there, then you just plug in. You find that particular point. Think about that one like you were doing last night where we kept saying the limit is x approaches 0 of z, and it had that point 0, 0. It was 0 every time. It's, it's the point. If the point is there and it's continuous, then the limit is the point. All right, same thing with the last one. You're just plugging in the x value. If I want the limit... As maybe x approaches, I don't know, 3 of x squared. 9. I'm just plugging in. It's that easy. Okay? So, uh, look at example 1. 5. Right? Why is it 5? The limit as x approaches 3 of a constant is the constant itself. Five, it's always gonna be five. It doesn't matter what you approach, you're always five. From the left and the right, still five, right? Does that make sense? Are y'all looking at me like that because it's too easy or? Okay. I said you're waiting on it to get like terrible. Maybe. I think you're all right, do two. The limit as x approaches 2 of 4x squared plus 3. So remember what I said, plug it in when you can. What happens if I plug it in? 4 times 2, 16 plus 3. Light work. Number three. Number three. You do number three. My, I know what you do for Sure, you all, I always start by plugging in. Yeah, plug it in. Well, you might get an undefined, and I'll show you. All right, so 1 squared plus 1 plus 4 over 1 plus 1, so 6 over 2. Yeah, 
Oh, what is four? Is it? How did you? Oh! This would definitely be a non calculator problem. <laughs> Pi over 2 is at the very top of the circle. Listen, I will tell you, if nothing else, make sure if I wake you up in the middle of the night, you can tell me any sine, cosine, tangent value in quadrant 1, in quadrant 1, or top, bottom, left, right. So 0, 1. At a very minimum. Well, your first test, you won't have the circle. You want to get that committed to memory before we get to the record. Because we're not going to talk about the I don't like that word. What is next unit? I don't like You told me next unit. There's eight units. One is the shortest, but we'll be done with unit eight by the end by March. So a couple more weeks probably. All right. All right, look. If I were an example three. And I had asked you to find the limit as x approaches negative 1. On the line, that's when, it's, the bottom can't be 0. That's when I hit a roadblock, right? So that's when plugging in doesn't work. Or maybe this was, I asked you to find the tangent of pi over 2. Yeah, that doesn't work like that. <laughs> So here's what we do. And this is where this little definition is coming from. If the if f of x and g of x equal each other, then the limits also equal each other. All that means is if you can manipulate it, in other words, if I had would you say that that equals x plus 2? If I started this way, I couldn't just plug negative 1 in, right? I might have to do some manipulation, get it to look like this, and then I could plug it. And so that's kind of where we're going with this. Mine's in a little bit different order than yours is. So yes, you might have to factor. You might have to complete the square. Whoa! Remember, though, that's not the calculus that's stumping you. And that stumps you. The calculus is evaluating the limit, right? But it's doing all that background stuff that kind of starts to throw us. So look at example five. Fires. Problem with plugging in. The problem with plug, plugging in at this point, there's zero on the bottom. I cannot plug in at this point, so I have to ha start thinking, oh my gosh, what can I do? Factor it. This is an easy factor. There's no limiting coefficient. We will fill stuff in, but after we factor. So how does the top factor? And then what happens? So really, I've got the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x minus 2. Can you plug in now? Yes, yes you can. Yeah. Yep. Okay, you try number 6. No, you didn't. Well, I know. I forgot. Is it plus or minus? Oh. 
No, what? Who told you? That's the formula for your difference of two cubes if you forgot it. Or sum of two cubes if you forgot that. Has your same change plus? Which roll? Yes. Perfect. Can you plug in now? Yes. What do you get? If you were to graph these, these would definitely be non-calculator problems, though, but if you were to graph them, you would see that the limit holds true. So, are these numbers working out for non-calculator problems, or would it have like a No. If it's non-calculator, it's definitely doable. Rewind back to pre-cal for a second. <laughs> Asymptote, right? If I asked you, look. Oh. Oh. If I if I asked you for the limit as I approach this value here now, right? Well, but it's it mm -mm, because one sided, right? So since it's just one sided, it wouldn't exist, right? But here, does that have a limit? Yes, remember, function value does not define the limit. So because that's a whole, it's approaching from both sides, it still has a limit. That's why I can do that. Okay. Does that make sense? Abby, you're looking at me. Okay. Here's where we get to the good stuff. It doesn't? What? Stop. Look at seven. Can you plug in on seven? Oh, uh, no. Because the bottom is zero. Stop it, Logan Freeman. No. So here's what I have to start thinking about. What in the world can I do? You can't change its value. Hold on, is that one, the one outside or inside? It's the one what? Outside or inside? Inside. Inside? My first thought on this, and I'll tell you what I got, no, mind you, I've been doing math a lot longer than y'all, but my first gut reaction on this is that's a difference between squares up top. No, 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 because it's not square, it's a square root, so that wouldn't work. So now what I'm thinking is I'm probably going to have to think about some type of conjugate and maybe that will help. Conjugate acids, bases? Well, that one will let me get your water. All right. No. Not to stop, Logan. We are to the hard part now. Rewind back. What is a conjugate? What flips? No. When we did imaginary numbers, the sign, all right, listen, 100% 90 minutes. That's what I got to get from you. 
the sign in the middle flips. Okay, remember when we did complex numbers and we multiplied by complex conjugates, it got rid of the imaginary part? Y'all remember that. We started in Algebra 2 and we did it in Pre-Cal also. If I had something like 2 plus 3i in order to get rid of the i in the bottom, I had to rationalize the bottom. I had to multiply by 2 minus 3i to get rid of it and it eliminated. We use conjugates in here a lot. They're just a little more complicated. For, actually, I'm going to do square root of x plus 1 plus 1 top and bottom. Okay, but wait. What does that give you? Stop throwing things. Yes, it would. Two two radicals that are exactly the same. You could, but then you still get. Yeah, but I'm going to have that. Why wouldn't you just square x plus 1? If you do this. Plus 1. I'm not squaring it. I'm it minus to start with. I'm doing plus the second time. I can't. All right. Plus. Just watch. Watch what's fixing to happen. Magic. These middle terms are canceling out. All of my mental math people, it's hard to see this without writing it down and, and literally foiling it because until you get used to doing it, I'll get to the bottom in just a second. All right, look, square root of x plus 1 times square root of x plus 1. Are we hung up on that? Okay, square root of x plus 1, square root of x plus 1. When you multiply exactly identical square roots, they just cancel each other out and what's left. Because this is the same thing as the square root of x plus 1 squared. Those are opposite operations. That's what I was saying. Why don't you just square root? I can't. Are you talking about just do that? Because if I do that, it's not a conjugate. The conjugate, by definition, changes. I changed this sign to a plus. It wouldn't get you anywhere. You could try it. Yeah, it wouldn't get you anywhere. Remember, my whole goal is for this to be simplified so far that I could plug in a zero and get an answer without it being undefined. The, one is, the, ones, are gone too. the ones are going to be gone too. All right, if the ones are gone also, look what my fraction becomes. I've got x over x times the square root of x plus 1 plus x. Can I simplify? Yes, all the x's are gone. Why does what? Mm -hmm. I can take an x away from everybody, right? Does everybody see that? I've got an x, an x, and an x. Okay, but be very careful because these places are going to be held with a 1. Right? Think about it like if I factored out. This is why sometimes you might only have a couple problems to do because they take so long. Right? If I factored that x out and then canceled it, are y'all still with me? I've got 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Don't lose sight of what my goal was. What was my goal? Why did I do all that work? That's exactly right. So I can plug the 0 in for x and get a value that's not undefined. Can you do that? Square root of, it'll be the square root of 1 
which is one, right? I'm going to zero. Yes. Which extra one are you looking at? This one? That's the one where I factored the X out here. And when I took it out of this one, I had to hold the place here with a one. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's as far algebraically as you have to go because if I stop right now, I can come back. Well, can you find the limit as X approaches zero? If your problem initially had looked like this, could you do that? Yes, that was the point the whole time was to get it to where I could do that. This is where it gets tough, right? We get lost in the algebra of it. 1 over the square root of 0 plus 1 plus 1. Right. Oh. You don't want to do that today. <laughs> it's not my video, but yeah, it's a video of another example like that. Can you get a QR <laughs> All right, look at. I don't know what that means. Look at example eight. We'll do example eight and stretch a minute before we move on. Yeah, we're running no behind. Can I plug in? Can I plug in? No. Sure. Why? What happens if I plug in? There's a zero in the bottom. I've got. We ran back to algebra two. Are we telling you like the number? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah, let me get through this problem. I'll let you. All right. So here I've got a complex fraction, right? Remember, you are digging back to every way possible that you can think to manipulate it, to rewrite it, to do it a different way so that you can plug in. This is algebraic manipulation. That is literally what this is. That is one of your standards. Evaluate limits using algebraic manipulation. Okay? I know. I need the I can have a denominator, it just can't go to zero. So, but this is the, well, when you add or subtract, yes, that's where you have to. Now, I wouldn't do that first. That is correct. That is correct. That is. Hey, you know, it's funny. We're doing sandwich theorem tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, everything has to do with one at one. I will going to grow. Good there news is, is good news is if you that. hate limits, you'll you won't mind derivatives. It's okay. All right. So somebody tell me what I can do. What's something I can do here? That's when you have a radical. Conjugate the Okay, if I solve the top, I got one over x plus three minus one over three. I need a common denominator, yes? Yep. You're doing awesome. My LCD here is going to be 3. Okay, I'm multiplying it by 3 because I'm forcing a common denominator by multiplying the top and the bottom by what's missing. Okay? So this becomes 3 minus, and now I'm subtracting all of this, right? Minus x minus 3 over 3 times x plus 3. Remember, this is the one where we said top, 
bottom Wait, together. Because it distributes third. Okay. So the top of this fraction is just negative x over 3 times x squared. Because the 3's cancel. 3 I mean, minus 3. Like this, like this one, this was minus 1 times x plus 3, so I had distributed a negative 1 through there. You can just leave it like that. Right. I yeah. could, I could, but here's my issue too. I've still got a denominator down here. I haven't said, remember top, bottom together? This is top. Bottom's already simplified, so now I can put them together. Wait, denominator is the bottom here. In other words, the numerator. So look, I don't divide a fraction. Instead, what half of? <laughs> times what together? Yes, yes, that's what this is because this was x over 1. So that's what this is. So this is top, flip bottom. Right? This is that rational fraction unit y'all love. The x is canceled, but this is good for me. Look at the limit I'm trying to find, and look at what my fraction is now becoming. That's exactly right. Why is this good for me? Well, we have that we can do. I can put the zero in now. Remember, that's the whole goal the whole time, is getting it to where I can plug in. If I put the zero in now, I get negative one over nine. All right, take two. This is what, and I will not mention it, but it is literally, if you don't know this yet, but it's the definition of a um, derivative. It is the difference quotient, and there are literally parts of FRQs as well as multiple choices that do this. They really, really, really like perfectionists. They like you to know where things come from. So, if I'm asked to evaluate this, I can't do anything with it right now because I can't plug in a zero for H, okay? That being said, I could go through and simplify. So how are you going to simplify? What are you going to do? You just have to, first off, distribute those. I could distribute this, but I can't distribute this first. Technically, you can with FOIL. Excellent. I've got a FOIL. So I'm going to have four times... And I'm just going to, I hope you guys can foil in your head now. What are you doing? What are you doing? That doesn't work out. Yes, that does. Why are oh, we doing no. Wait, you no, no. No. You're the negative one here. You're the negative one here. And you're also the negative You're the negative one. You're the negative one. You're the negative one. You're the negative one. You're the negative All right. Listen. Listen. Shut up. When you when you square a binomial, it always squares this way. It's the square of the ends, and the middle is double the product of them. That's a quick. There's no. Do not waste time on SAT, ACT, and, and calculus exams and things that are time by foiling something like this out. It's always the square of the ends, double the product in the middle. This is to a power of two. That's what it always, always, always is. Okay. Now this is. And now, right, so now what I'm going to do, and all I'm doing is basic, basic. Y'all, I'm teaching Algebra 1 this today, so I know y'all can do this. 4x squared. I'm going to distribute this negative 3 through here. I'm going to give you a second on your own. Clean it up and see what happens. Go. Them or just plug in, there's, there's not as many you have to manipulate. All right. Piece wise, look at what they're asking me to do. They're asking me to find the limit of a piecewise function. Y'all think in your brain about what a piecewise function does. Right? And, and it, could it be continuous? It could. Does it have to be? It might jump, but where is my break happening? What's where, at two, right? At where the piecewise comes together. So if it's asking me for the 
limit as I approach two, right? The limit, and here's where you have to think about that property. The limit as x approaches two has got to be the limit as x approaches two from the left, which equals the limit as x approaches two from the right. Those two things, if I can find these two things and they are the same, then I can find this. Well, because it's piecewise, go ahead, Emma. We look at each one individually. You're thinking the right way. This is because this says when x is bigger than 2, and if I think about a coordinate plane and I'm at 2, bigger than 2 is this way, right? So this is the right side limit. This is the left limit. So I need to make, if they don't equal each other, if this happens, then this does not exist. Okay? But if it does, and here's what they're going to do to you. They're going to say, show why the limit as x approaches 2 is this. Or show why the limit as x approaches 2 does not exist. And you have to show, well, because the right-hand limit either does or does not. Now, these are easy, and most of the time these are easy. What is the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x? This is the form, this is the equation 11. I'm referencing. So it's 3 times 2 squared minus 1. There's no manipulation there, right? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. I was saying, what I was saying, if if these two are not the same, then the limit doesn't exist. Remember, we looked at it on a graph; we just haven't done it with the equation. If it comes into a different value from both ends, one of them's on the right, exactly. One of them's on the right, one of them's on the left. Yeah. Well, you can, we're going to plug it in anyway, even though it's not. You're thinking around the right, and that's going to come into play with our continuity real soon. Um, but as far as finding the limits, because remember, the limits get really, really close, but they don't actually touch there. So you can use it for limits, but you can't use it for other stuff. But that's a good thought. So, all right, so Doja said they're not the same. Five times two plus 2 is 12. These are not the same, so this limit does not exist. If they were the same, if I'd have gotten 11 for both of them, then the overall limit would be 11. That's all I got for you today.